Um, so hello everybody, this is, uh, this is a bit of a different uh, meeting we're having today. This is going to be a, a national um, level event that we're having today and we're going to have the wonderful uh, Birgit Neger uh, uh, with us today from Germany. Uh, this is a bit of a different event because it's been a while that we have been talking about service design here in the US um, and there have been some uh, questions over maybe the uh, maturity of service design in the US versus Europe and Asia. Um, and we're, we're just wondering if there is any truth to that. So we have decided to collaborate with uh, the wonderful people at Frog, as well as SCAD, the uh, service, um, service design um, uh, school in, in, the, in the US. Um, and we said to kind of, kind of do like a, a survey, a benchmark survey of service design in the US. Um, and today we're going to discuss the preliminary findings that we found. We launched that about a month ago, I think, and we had uh, a couple of hundred uh, answers so far. I would like for you to, if you haven't taken a survey yet, please do so. Uh, it's, it's still open. You can still participate in the survey. Um, it's anonymous and it's pretty quick. We just want to have an idea of um, who is doing service design in the US, uh, how well it's doing for you, um, are there any issues, challenges, and most importantly, give us a benchmark so we can compare with potentially Europe and, and other countries. Uh, in the world. So um, let's let's start very quickly. We have a lot of stuff to go through. So today we're going to be talking about the uh, the steps design in the US. Um, this is uh, an effort that's going to be allowing us in the future to benchmark us and see the progression over the next year and two years and five years from now, how we're we progressing. Uh, and we're going to discuss uh, in deeper details with Birgit um, the findings, the preliminary findings from the survey. And of course, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, uh, and if you'd like to share some of your challenges in your service design space, um, we will definitely take your questions and share them with Birgit or the rest of the uh, panel. Um, and we're going to go through this now. So very quickly, I'd like to introduce uh, the three partners for this uh, initiative. So Frog obviously has been a, a, a very a visible staple of service design in the US for a long time, uh, service design net network and North America chapters, as well as SCAD, uh, the Seven Eye College of Art and Design. I'm going to hand over the, uh, the microphone for a couple of seconds so uh, Jess can introduce Frog and then we'll talk to Mauricio from SCAD who can talk to us for a couple of seconds about uh, SCAD. Jess? Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Jess Leach. Uh, I am the general I'm the general manager at Frog, and I also run the service design practice across the US. So happy to be here today. Thank you for joining us on this very excellent service design day. Um, let me tell you just a couple of quick things about Frog in case you haven't heard about us. So we've been around for about 50 years, um, and we were really born out of the belief that design can must connect to people's emotions to serve their real needs. So we've been working with um, design leaders since 1969 um, who, and working with them basically to help kind of grow this belief and share this belief that form follows emotion and um, to try and really improve people's lives together. Um, so we kind of help businesses grow by creating experiences that people love. So we do a lot of work in kind of launching new businesses and improving CX at scale. And service design is a big part of that. So because we all know that it takes more than well-designed screens to actually make services real. So we really use service design to help our clients invent new services and design the systems that get them into the market. So we kind of help with inventing new services or fixing existing products or services, mm -hmm. launching new services, or also building service design capability. And we're so, so keen to find out what the situation is in the US as far as service design is concerned. So please do fill in the survey and we'll be really excited to share the outcomes of that with you all in the near future. Hand over to Mauricio or well, back to you, Greg. Uh, Mauricio, do you want to introduce us to uh, SCAD for those who are actually not aware of um, the school and the program, service design program? Yeah. Mauricio? Hello. Yes. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with Birgit, uh, Jess, uh, Greg, and all the Service Design Network community. I'm the grad program coordinator for the Service Design uh, uh, program at SCAD, and uh, we're partnering with um, Frog and SDN to uh, support this uh, very interesting survey uh, that I guess uh, was started by 
SDN Mexico, then went to X SDN Portugal, and now SDN uh, US. And we hope we, we bring this uh, to a global scale at some point. So please uh, fill uh, the survey so we can have a better picture of the cert design uh, status in the US. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mauricio. Uh, so, um, so I guess we can have we can introduce uh, Birgit very quickly. Birgit, can you tell us a couple of um, minutes about who you are, what you do, and the uh, current state of service design network in the world, and and and, uh, and uh, what you're doing? We'll keep it super short. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, everybody, for organizing this. Um, I have been the very first professor for service design worldwide in the year 1995. It came to me like uh, magic. I had not heard of service design before and suddenly I was a professor. So throughout the last 26 years, I've been inventing and collaborating in, in professionalizing the, the domain. And I was the co-founder of the Service Design Network, which was launched in 2004. Uh, and I think the Service Design Network has played quite a role in bringing the idea of service design to the world and making this a recognized profession. Uh, today, I'm still the president and I love it, I breathe it, and service design is really something that I feel makes the world a better place. So I'm, I'm very much appreciating how you guys are pushing it in the United States and in Northern America. That was Thank quick, you. wasn't it? That was very quick, it was impressive. Thank you, Brooke, I appreciate it. <laughs> Um, I think that now we can just start uh, diving into the primary findings, right, Murthy? Thank you. Hi. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, we Today, we are going to talk about uh, the state of service design, and we will be sharing our, yeah, share first a little bit about what this research uh, entails, and as well, uh, share the first findings that we have and discuss those with, uh, with Birgit. So, very grateful for Beria to be here on this uh, important uh, International Service Design Day. Um, a few months ago, just a little bit going back in time, a few months ago, I was uh, highly inspired by Beria's amazing report about the future of service design. If you haven't read it, please do. Um, and I was writing uh, something about the future of service design in the US. Um, and for this uh, blog, I was looking for data about the current state of surf design and specifically the US, and unfortunately, we couldn't find any resource. That's why we, um, so Be uh, Bethany and Krista, who are also on this, uh, on this, on, on this uh, call, we decided to initiate this research ourselves in collaboration with Surf Design Network and SCAT. Um, the goal of this research uh, was to uh, quantify the state of service design and measure the expected growth over time, as well as to increase awareness of the value that service design can bring in the US. Um, in the past couple of months, we had conversations with various members uh, of the service design a community abroad about how to set up this research uh, to make sure that we are getting comparable data so that, yeah, that we really are going to understand the similarities and differences between our countries. Uh, for example, we talked about it with Service Design Mexico, indeed, as mentioned by Mauricio, who has conducted a similar research, but as well, Laura in Portugal, who uh, with her Service Design Network team has conducted also a yeah, similar research, and uh, we hope with yeah by collaborating to to be able to to identify what the U.S. makes unique. So uh, our goal with this research is to gather both quantitative as well as qualitative uh, data. So we mentioned already a few times uh, we have a survey out there uh, targeting service design professionals in the U.S. If you haven't filled it in, please do. Um, you can find the survey in the chat. Um, but in addition to the quantitative data that we are gathering, we also want to, um, yeah, we also want to um, um, conduct interviews with thought leaders across industries um, 
and uh, we have had uh, nine interviews so far and today we will mainly discuss the insights that we gather through those kind of conversations. So today we want to talk a little bit about the preliminary insights that we had so far with the interviews um, and discuss opportunities and challenges with Birgit that pops up during those conversations, various conversations. Thank you Birgit as well again for joining us today uh, in this packed day, uh, yeah in this packed International Service Design Day. Um, for the audience, uh, if you have any questions, as mentioned by Brandon, please feel free to drop them in the chat. And after our question for Birgit, we will try to address them during, uh, at the end of this conversation with Birgit. So before, uh, yeah, I will start uh, Birgit with sharing an overview of the history of service design as presented in your future of service design report. Uh, thank you again for this, for drafting this uh, insightful report. The report uh, has shown us how service design practice roughly started 35 years ago and how it has evolved from experimentation to the new normal. Um, to zoom in on what happened the last couple of years, uh, specifically here in the US, yeah, we highlighted and added some of those service design initiatives here. And in 2004, the first service design course was introduced in, uh, at the Carnegie Mellon University in California. And this university also hosted the first and second service design conference here in the US. In 2009, SCAD uh, started its master's degree in uh, service design uh, and Chris Risden, one, one of the interview participants that we had a conversation with a few weeks ago, uh, also wrote the book Orchestrating Experiences in 2008. So since early 2000, various service design initiatives have taken place in the US. So Birgit, um, our first question for you uh, was, what is your perspective on the maturity of service design in North America versus Europe? Well, at first glance, many people would say service design is much more mature in Europe as opposed to North America, um, which at first glance, um, yes, uh, I think in, in the Northern American industries, um, user experience, customer experience is being perceived uh, much stronger, plays a, a much stronger role. Um, also, design thinking has quite an audience in the Northern American communities. But uh, when you look deeper, customer experience or user experience is the outcome of what a proper service design process does. It is aiming at improving and innovating the customer experience. And so I personally believe there is a lot of hidden service design or silent service design in the United States, um, which is great. And uh, I mean, it's like excavating a mine and you have to just, you know, make it more transparent and help people to do it maybe slightly more systematic um, and create that belonging to the community. So I don't believe that there is a lot of difference in the maturity of service design from a regional perspective. Because when you look at Europe, you will find that there is countries and areas where service design is really very strong. And you could even ask people on the street and they would know what it is, like in Finland, for example. There is other regions in, in Europe uh, where service design is not very much uh, perceived and it's having a hard time to, you know, gain uh, attention. And my question was then, of course, what are the, the um, factors that, um, that support the maturity of service design? And maybe you could allow me to share my screen for a second. I won't be long. Just... This is just the starting point for conversation. Uh, maturity factors for service design. Um, five, very simple. I think the design maturity in a region or in a nation uh, plays a big role. Has design been perceived beyond styling? Has design perceived as a strategic factor? If yes, 
that makes it a lot easier for service design to, to step in. Uh, in Germany, we had the pleasure of having Dieter Rams, who was working with Brown and uh, who was a role model for Jonathan Ivey from Apple. He was a guy who has a very holistic understanding of design. And he, he claimed that design is in a constant evolution, reacting on the cultural and technological and economical changes. And based on such a tradition, service design is just a logical outcome of this, you know, evolution of, of design in general. So I think that is a precondition of, you know, service design getting easy access to markets, uh, that there is a design maturity and not just design as styling and, and, and you know, decoration. Organized support systems. I think in a country where there is a, uh, design councils, design organizations that continuously support the development, the communication uh, around design, help service design to mature faster. Um, and uh, research funding connected to design that comes in Germany, for example, from governmental organizations where there is explicit research funding for service design. In the UK, you will find it. In Finland, you will find it. I'm not so sure how much of that organized support systems as design councils could be networks, uh, funding systems from government exist in the United States. But that is a precondition for success. Experimental educational curricula. How fast can you adapt and change education? Um, how much flexibility do you have as a professor to try out something new? Or how long is the process to apply for new um, syllabus and, and, and uh, stuff like that? So in Germany, uh, when I started service design, I, I was totally free. And I can see many other schools in Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon was one of the very first schools in uh, the United States. It was the very first school in the United States where Shelley Evanson started to play with service design. And this playfulness, this permission to play and experiment is not only important for the educational uh, community, but also for corporate cultures. How much willingness do, do companies and public sector organizations have to, to experiment? to also risk to fail. Is that part of the attitude, part of the corporate culture that, you know, you might be shamed because it didn't work? And last but not least, channels for visibility. I think service design in Europe has gained channels for visibility through events, conferences, through publications, through the network. So there were many, many ways of, of creating visibility. And I think in the United States, this is happening. I mean, I see the services on Network Dallas, I see SCAD, I see New York, I see San Francisco, I see many, many ways of, of making service design visible. But to wrap it up, I think the maturity is not that much difference, uh, different on a regional perspective. It's more about maturity factors that could, you know, relate to non-national uh, or regional components. Thank you, Birgit. This is uh, this is great, and it's very in line with uh, the hypotheses that we had. Uh, indeed, um, I, I'm from the Netherlands, and I moved to the US a few years ago. And yeah, based on the initial conversations that we had, we, I thought, oh, um, service design is less mature in US than in Europe. But indeed, through our work that we are doing at the moment, through the community that we are part of, and and yeah, the initial findings of our research, uh, I feel like the maturity of the service design in the US is far higher than what I initially expected. So happy to prove that during this research uh, even more. Um, yeah, to continue with uh, some of the topics that we that popped up during those initial conversations uh, of the past couple of weeks. Um, yeah, there were various interesting conversations that we had. and. Uh, we talked about service design, how service design can be more inclusive in the U.S. and how we can be part of that, uh, what technology plays, what role technology plays, and uh, well, various topics. But we do want to highlight those, the following three during this conversation uh, today. Um, so about we want to talk about how service design meets digital transformations within organizations how to quantify the impact of service design and the challenges around this, uh, yeah, 
how to make that more visible, as well as uh, talk about how to find funding for service design within organizations and abroad. Um, so let's dive into the first topic. So during those conversations with uh, service design leaders, we learned about how digital transformation within organizations often has provided a natural entry point for service design. For example, one uh, in-house service design team has started within technology uh, business unit. And as they came maturity, um, the service designers transitioned to their own business unit reporting directly to leadership. Um, yeah, so uh, services for digital transformation has provided a lot of opportunities, but there are even more opportunities that we can explore further. Also mentioned by Tally, who is service designer strategic design lead at a healthcare company. Accompanying with this uh, insight, there are also some opportunities for the service design tools and methods to evolve further and to become more agile, uh, but also to leverage technologies in the methods and, and tools that we have. So relate to this topic, our first question for Birgit, um, how would you describe the relationship between digital transformation and service design within Europe? Well, mm Again, I would not draw such a strong line between Europe and the rest of the world, but I think there is a strong relationship between the digital transformation and service design in general. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the uh, Greek uh, mythology. Um, so are you familiar with the Trojan horse? Yes, of course. <laughs> so often I call uh, the digital transformation the, trial, uh, the Trojan horse for service design. Digital transformation is a must for the public sector and for the private sector. There are budgets, there are strategic goals, there are KPIs that have to be met. And if we succeed to bring service design in that process of, uh, of uh, digital transformation, the outcomes will be much more holistic, much more user-centered, uh, and much more um, future robust than if we leave it to the IT um, and the web design. Uh, so I think the digital transformation is a great opportunity to rethink and redesign services in a holistic, um, interdisciplinary, user-centered way. Um, and so it's the Trojan horse. But what, do, what does that mean? It means that for one thing, we should educate the IT people and the web designers and the uh, interface designers and make them aware of the opportunities that are within that digital transformation and how we can go beyond pushing pixels from the left to the right and you know creating new channels for bad services. Um, so we need to educate the people that are at the forefront of, of designing digital um, channels. And we need to bring the digital skills to our service design community, because if they are not aware of these opportunities, then they will be lost. So basically, uh, my, my claim is, uh, use the Trojan horse, use the opportunity uh, to help people in that transformation, do not necessarily put service design as the label on the bucket, um, as the thing that needs to be sold. It's more about um, the idea behind service design that needs to be sold. And if the label needs to be digital transformation experts, then you are digital transformation experts. Hmm? And you bring service design into the fore building. Yeah. yeah, sort of trying to take the back door uh, and gain more confidence within, uh, make, gain more power within organizations. And If it's necessary. I mean, sometimes people ask for service design. That's great. But if they don't ask for service design, give them what they want. Give them digital yeah. transformation. Yeah. I, if, if I could just add something quickly as well. I think it's a, um, I think it's a really important thing for service designers to remember because 
what is happening quite a lot in this digital transformation is that we're just digitizing existing processes and systems that actually were never properly designed as services. And so there's a real opportunity for us to completely rethink the way that products and services are delivered in when we're digitizing them rather than just necessarily yeah. turning something that was never intentionally designed into something that could be there forever now. So yeah. it's it's such a good opportunity. I mean, what, one example that is in Germany, I mean, it really makes you laugh. Germany is not so um, user-centered or citizen-centered when it comes to public services. So <laughs> today, when you become a parent, you need to connect to seven different administrative units uh, in order to register the child, apply for mm -hmm. money, apply for passport. It's amazing. And I mean, you want to hug your little baby and learn how to change the diapers and you have to do all these things, seven different units. And now it's um, um, PwC that uh, is helping, not always in the best, but they are embracing service design. I mean, they have bought uh, quite a few um, reputable service design agencies lately, LiveWork and uh, former students of mine from Berlin, IXDS. So they are trying to look at this in a more holistic way. And they have suggested to the German government a one-stop uh, solution for mm. fresh, fresh parents, which is amazing. And that's what we really need to rethink the processes, to combine them, to make them easier, accessible. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, time's not by a, a thousand in the US, I think. <laughs> the time's those experiences <laughs> by a thousand. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> It's such a good opportunity for across all it sectors, is. across yeah. the, you know, what we expect as citizens, what we expect as consumers. Yeah. Now, one thing that I would like to add also in, into this discussion about digital transformation is uh, the assessment that service design provides as this, uh, through this systemic holistic perspective, right? Um, what we just saw with Colonial Royal here, here in the US uh, is uh, predicted to happen in a, in a larger scale at some point. So a digital pandemic might hit us. And service design also as a risk management, risk assessment uh, tool can bring a lot of value to this digital transformation, which I think is um, very wise for companies to, to start thinking about this. Thank you. Um, yeah, and, and also to Birgit's note about uh, we need we shouldn't be married to the label of service design. In our first initial uh, findings of the survey, we indeed see a lot of people having the the, the uh, job title of product manager or indeed digital transformation consultant or any other uh, title, but they do practice a lot of service design, like over 70% of service design in their actual work. So it's also in line with one of the findings that we have in, yeah, based on the first uh, 200, I think over 200. I have to say, I love the term silent service design. There is already some research on silent design, um, but silent service design, I have, um, Clay, we're positioned with a former PhD student of mine. There are so many people that have the attitude, uh, who have the skills, and who are basically doing service design without knowing it, and who can only, you know, slightly improve what they are doing through the structure, through a better access to methodology, to the community. Uh, so I think that's something that we need to be aware of. Uh, Mirthe, do we want to switch to... Um Bethany, do you have any more questions about the next slides? Yeah. You need to reshare your screen, please. Yeah, well, uh, I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hi, everyone. I am Bethany. It's nice to virtually be with you all. I'm a senior service designer at Frog, and I moved. Uh, from London a few years ago, where I practiced service design there, and over the last few years have also been very eager to learn about where service design is at here in the US. So to transition into the next piece of insight we have here, it's around quantifying the impact of service design. So through many of our interviews, we asked about 
how companies measure the impact of service design within organizations and how they express this impact to leadership. So we heard that service designers and leaders maybe have a hard time quantifying that value to service design of service design to executives. Um, we heard sort of anecdotes like people talk about and they design services differently or they include the human perspective in their work. Um, however, it's overall difficult in many ways to show the value or to quantify the impact of service design when oftentimes service designers are only sometimes allowed or it's positioned for them to be a part of that strategic part of the conversation but not always that zoomed in part where it comes into that implementation side and where they get to start linking it back to that overarching metric and so our question to you, Birgit, is we would really love to know where you are seeing kind of trends, um, trends in Europe for how to qu quantify the value of service design. Okay, I love that question. And because I knew that you were going to ask that, I have prepared a couple of slides and I would love to share them. Um, So, um, I think quantifying the value of service design has quite a tradition in Europe. Um, that's at least where it's rooted. Uh, and it has like two directions. Uh, we have been quantifying the value of service design for the practice of service design in general and for distinct projects. Uh, my, my first perception of quantification of value of the practice in general was a study that the UK Design Council did in the year 2005, uh, where they showed how design in general improves the profitability of uh, organizations and how the investments into service design double the uh, profitability of organizations and that was like 2005 I don't I can't share all the studies um, just you know this is tiny in, insight in 2012 for example there was a scoping study on service design also initiated by the design council UK in collaboration with a couple of other organizations where we identified the the key value of service design for the public and the private sector in 2018, IBM, under the label of design thinking practice, which in that case is very much related to the service design praxis, uh, practice, uh, worked with Forrester to um, evaluate the total economic impact of uh, their activities. Um, and this one made me really laugh. It's by uh, Ricardo uh, Martins, um, who is now working at SCAD. And I think uh, he was then at that point still in, yeah, SCAD. <laughs> he was still in Brazil. And he evaluated the power of service design uh, from all the value it has on customer experience, less costs, increased revenue, more revenue, return on investment. What, so there's lots and lots of studies and uh, I'm, I'm happy to share um, all of them. Uh, and I think that's good. And every service designer should be aware of these studies uh, that relate to the overall value of service design. Um, as the service design network, we have done two bigger impact reports in the health sector and in the public sector in order to better understand the value and the impact of service design. And it was really interesting. We found that there is a, a big impact on the strategic level, on the cultural level, on the educational level, on the experience level. Uh, so the impact of service design is not as you would think at first glance only related to the interface and the touch points and the ease of use. No, it is really about organizational and cultural change and education of people. So those were also studies related to the, to the overall impact of service design. Um, now, project related, I think for us as service designers, it is a responsibility to measure I'm sorry, designers usually don't like to measure, but we need to measure. If we want to create credibility for the discipline, we need to measure. Uh, this was a really cool project by Designit. Uh, it was the first um, 
Service Design Award in the year 2015 when they reduced the waiting time for breast cancer diagnosis by 90%. That is amazing. I mean, as a woman, I think uh, you can empathize, but even as a man, you can, what it means to have to wait 90% less until you get the positive or negative result of your breast cancer diagnosis. Um, Philips created an intensive ambulatory care program for multiple chronic diseases. They reduced the costs by 32% and had 45% less hospitalization. Uh, the UK Design Council collaborated on the aggression and violence in uh, hospitals against nurses and doctors. Uh, through better communication throughout the whole journey, they reduced um, the... the um, irritation of patients by 88% and uh, the threat in body language by 50%. So you can go into that. This doesn't come from nothing. It comes from the willingness of service designers to measure. Mm, and I think it is super important. So what I would say, in general, you can look at the service design award annual. There are many of these um, cases that all have to be implemented and they all have to be measured, are published. Um, I think that is quite interesting. On the other hand, I think when it comes to measuring value, service designers have to better empathize with their clients. We have to understand what counts for them. What is their problems? How do they measure success? Uh, what is the, the key um, indicators that they use? And then we have to help them to transform. I really found it quite cool. It comes from Accenture, I think. Um, they transform the KPI into CPI. So not the key performance indicators, but the customer performance indicators. And that I think is something that really re resonates with service design, that we help organizations to go beyond what is their performance indicator to what is the customer's performance indicators, which pays back to the revenues for the company. So I think we have to learn the language of our customers and the clients, and we have to help them to transform them to get better. Yeah, that was all. <laughs> you can cut my slides off. I can do it myself. So. Hmm? Mirta, have you, are you able to share that? The slide, perfect, perfect. Okay, so following on from that, um, yeah, awesome point. I, I personally feel super inspired to go and measure everything. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Birgit, um, for that inspiration and important. Um, yeah, I think for us all to remember as service designers. Um, but our next insight is around finding funding. So essentially that bottom line, um, kind of back to that measuring piece here. So at many organizations, we found that service designers struggle to work across silos sometimes. Those silos are often a result of that, how that kind of org organization itself is, is maybe set up or the, how the funding is, is allocated. Um, often service design teams are funded through sort of one specific business unit and then making those kind of uh, business unit interests more the top priority and sometimes skewing the interest of the project. So what we are seeing as a kind of opportunity to potentially better position service design is that it could be more about reducing risk and maybe the measurement sort of lying there. So across the business, um, looking at kind of how service designers could, um, yeah, could be better sell services, sell our work across the business units through the lens of of that reducing risk piece. And so our question to you, uh, well, first I will reveal um, a kind of quote that that really sort of helped us inspire some of this, some of this thought is by uh, Chris Ridson, who is a principal designer at HEB, and he is the author of Orchestrating Experiences. He said that anything that is proverbially cross silo doesn't have a centralized budget. It's hard to have a role or a team that is assigned cross silo because their value isn't always tied to a silo anymore. Um, so a bit of a challenge. Um, and again, our question to you is how do we sell service design and service designers? Mm -hmm. Surprise, surprise. I knew that that question was gonna come. 
<laughs> my, my first answer, my first answer is um, we do not sell service design. We sell value for systems. And even though I love to preach service design and I want the community to be really big and I want service design to be the new normal, I still think that as service designers, we do not sell service design, we sell value for systems. And then it really depends. It means in the end that we should not focus on the label service design, we should focus on the value we can bring to an organization. And that means we need to empathize with the client, we need to connect to their concerns, and we need to help them to reframe them. Um, as I mean, you're all aware that most uh, clients that come to us already have the idea of the solution and service design helps them to go beyond that uh, first idea of a solution by better understanding the problem. Um, so I think that is our role when we are selling our solutions to show the client that we can help them to reframe the problem, for example, by showing that it is not a marketing problem or it is not a sales problem or it is not an IT problem, but it is a journey problem. Um, and in that sense, you know, reframe uh, also the, the contract that we are making. So I think that is really super important and uh, uh, take that authority to, to, you know, go beyond the, the tiny bit of the cake that the client might be offering you, believing that this is the problem because he has the tools. You know, Václavik? Huh? Mm. If you uh, um, know how to use a screwdriver, every problem will be a screwdriver problem. So we, we need to make sure that, that we help clients to reframe. I think when it comes to getting budgets and funding, we need to be equipped with a great repertoire of valuable cases. Not only our own, but if we can show our clients examples on how service design has helped to solve complex problems in systems, um, we open doors. Um, the SDN case study library is definitely a nice resource um, where you find cases. Uh, of course, you only have your own um, repertoires. But I really think that uh, we, we need to go into organizations and help them understand what powerful impact service design can have. I would also say propose valuable deliverables. For many clients, it's a journey into the unknown. They have not heard about service design before. Um, they are not sure if they are not wasting their money. Um, so the better we can define our own project journey through creation of valuable deliverables, step by step by step throughout the journey, um, the more trust we can create. And that leads to the last point. Um, I think connecting is the most important thing uh, when it comes to creating funding and to selling service design. You have to build trust. You have to build valuable relationships. You have to build on the strength of the organization that you are working with, and you have to respect what they are doing. Um, I think designers do tend here and there to be a bit like the smart ass coming in there and thinking, oh, oh we know it all. No, you don't. Uh, so respect for the organization is a crucial part of selling selling service design. Um, and uh, that means you have to partially adopt to the culture and to the language, but at the same time, not getting lost in it, but keeping the ability to reframe it. And by the way, read Touchpoint, there is an issue selling service design. I can put the link into the uh, chat. I had prepared this. This did not come from nothing. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, so Brian, if you don't mind, I know you have you only have about ten minutes left. This is a certain time day, so you have to, you've been very very busy today. So, really appreciate your help. Um, if it's okay, we're going to ask you a couple of questions uh, from the audience, um, and I think Krista is going to ask a question from Dale. Krista, yes, thank you, Greg. Um, so, Dale asked, uh, do you do users' expectations and needs vary by cultural context? Um, and does service design provide particular value for brands developing global ex experiences? Oh. Wow, an amazing question. Uh, I wish there were more research on this. 
Uh, I, I have done a research, research study, I think it was in the year 2010 with Nokia. Can you imagine the company Nokia was still doing um, mobile phones and communication? McDonald's and Siemens. So these three partners were investing in a research project on uh, cultural differences in service consumption. Um, it, it was it was super interesting, and I truly believe that there are differences. They are, of course, being um, lined through the globalization, uh, but the priorities that are being set are truly different. I remember a workshop that we did with Nokia in New York, uh, where we had the global leadership team, and we asked them to uh, represent a specific service scene through a service enactment. Um, and it was then the Indian team, it was the Northern American team, it was the uh, Scandinavian team, and they had to enact a specific sales situation. Uh, they had to arrange the room, they had to arrange the props, they had to play the scene. It was amazing how different it was from the setup of the, of the scene, from the props they used, from the, the way they led the conversation. So I think, yes, there is big cultural differences. And I think there is much more space to explore beyond service marketing. I mean, intercultural service marketing um, has a lot of, of studies, but for service design, there is uh, many opportunities. Very good. Thank you, Birgit. Um, Brenda, do you have a question from the audience? Yes. Um, we have a question from Kim Morton. She's asking, can we approach measurement of service design benefits in a similar way to value stream mapping? Well, I think there is many different ways on how to measure the value. And I think you have to connect to your client. Your client has to accept the measures because you will need data from the client. Mm, and uh, if they work with KPI, with net, uh, net uh, promoter um, scores, with uh, the ROIs, uh, you have to understand what they are talking about. And you might want to then relate it to the tool that you prefer and then argue what is the benefit of your own uh, proposal. And I think that service design can add value by combining customer value measures to company me value measures. It can bring value by um, combining qualitative and quantitative uh, because a, a net promoter score is nice, but what does it tell you? Basically nothing. So service design can add a lot of value by, by improving the tools, by combi combining different tools. But uh, there is not that one answer. There is not that one service design tool. It has to relate to what your client knows and what your client is willing to, you know, move forward. So, Birgit, I'm going to jump in and ask you one more question. So, I know I work in the consultancy space and we have a lot of clients who over the past several years have been talking about journey mapping, design thinking, and they're just now getting to a point of understanding service design. Um, not the maturity of the, of the discipline itself in the US. We're talking about, we're talking about the education part of it. Um, what do you recommend for service designers to um, equip themselves with not necessarily selling service design, but going from like a journey map to the actual service design discipline, right? So people are starting to ask about blueprinting. It's like they've heard about it. It's becoming kind of like a thing. They've, you know, it's like, hey, I think I want to have a blueprint. They don't really know what it is or what it does, but they've, they've heard about it and they want it. So what do you recommend we do around that? Uh, read uh, the future of service design. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, the basic service design process and methodology is becoming a commodity. Um, I, I talk to IT people in my university and they are building personas, they are doing journey mapping. And so that is not magic anymore. Uh, when we started in the early 2000s, uh, bringing a large uh, journey map to the wall and having some telling personas was oh, overwhelming. It is not anymore. So if as a service designer, you cannot bring additional value through helping the organization to change their structures and their culture by educating the organization on service design and helping them to make this the new normal, to make that the approach not for one project, but for the way they approach projects by helping them to maybe bring ethics into the conversation. And that is a big issue 
um, I think we as a design community are being confronted with the question on how white, how middle class and how, um, I don't know, uh, isolated are we from specific silent users and how can we help organizations to better embrace ethical questions, systematically embrace them throughout the project that includes sustainability questions. And I think one last topic that we will be touching in the last six minutes might be technology. So I think service design has to grow. Uh, we cannot lay back and think, oh yeah, we have personas, we have journey maps, we have touch points. Uh, that, that's not sufficient. Very good. Um, talking about education, I think we have one question. Uh, Robin, do you want to uh, ask a question from Natalie about education? For sure, yeah. Uh, so Natalie was asking, uh, she's got a bachelor's degree in industrial design. I do as well. Uh, and she's currently a UX designer and uh, wondering uh, if it makes sense to go for a master's degree in service design or uh, can I call myself a service designer today? Um, and before, before we get the panel to jump in on that, I'll just tell you from my experience, I naturally migrated towards service design from industrial design. The parallels are remarkable and uh, it felt very natural uh, to fit right in with the tools and the processes. The inquisition was the thing that was that was common uh, for the most part. So I, I'm not feeling a need to get a degree. That's just my point of view, but I'd like to hear from others. I would also second that, uh, Christopher. I also studied industrial service design and moved moved pretty immediately into um, service design. So, to agree with that. So, what do you think, Bergit? This is actually more question for Mauricio, but let's see what Bergit has to say about it. <clears throat> As I said, there is silent service design, there is this transition of design from interaction product design into service design, but there's also people who learn it from scratch. And um, I think a master degree in service design helps people to systematically explore um, the, the diverse levels uh, of what service design means up to the highest level of really strategic, cultural and organizational change. Um, and uh, I, I know a couple of master programs that are totally valuable um, and that I can full heartedly recommend. But I also know many designers that have learned service design from uh, doing and who do amazing work. So it's very hard to find an answer. The Service Design Network has created an accreditation system where we have this uh, professional and master accreditation that is more based on experience, where we say those are people that have grown into the world of service design. Um, and we have the practitioner accreditation, and those are people who learn it step by step, a specific amount of hours, a specific amount of cases that they do, um, even doing a test. So we try to accommodate both, those that come naturally from other fields and those that learn it step by step. And both is great. If I, if I may? Sure. Um, um, of course, Robin and Bethany, they, they had opportunities and, and uh, events in their professional lives that taught them or exposed them to the right experience, right? I guess what uh, we recently um, uh, implemented uh, an MA in service design online uh, after uh, demand of uh, many corporations in the, in the U.S., and what a master degree can give you is a, a better certainty that you will be exposed to the right experiences, right? That's how you develop a curriculum. You imagine that like, you take great professionals in service design, what exactly were the challenges they were uh, exposed to to become uh, these uh, great professionals, and you simulate those uh, uh, experiences through a systematic approach, right? So that's, that's the, the importance. You, you may be lucky and stumble upon this experience by yourself, and, uh, which is great, or you can actually uh, be supported by uh, pass a learning pass that was proven uh, to work. Uh, we've been very successful uh, at the service design program at SCAD. We have one of the highest employment rates. Uh, 
all sorts of things. We have one more things. minute. No more advertisement, Mauricio. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> one so, more minute. <laughs> so, which is one of the reasons why we actually did this survey is because we want to have a better idea of the education uh, trends in service design in the US. So, if you don't mind, Krista, do you want to, if you haven't taken a survey yet, please do so. It's very quick, it's very simple, it takes a few minutes, it's anonymous. So, Krista, tell us how to get the survey done. Yeah, so Brent has just posted the link in the chat here. So, if you haven't yet, please take the survey. It takes about 15 minutes to take. Um, and all of your responses are being collected. We're going to analyze them in the coming months. Uh, we're really excited to uncover the different trends of service design in the United States. So all of your input is, is going to be reviewed and will be highly valuable. Um, and again, look out in the next couple of months. Once we do that analysis of the data, we'll, we'll be reporting it back um, together with um, SCAD and the Service Design Network um, back to the community so that we can all use this data moving forward. So oh, we have, we have to let Birgit go. She has to go. She's been extremely graceful and, and very nice to have you and, and share your insight and your information with us. Thank you so much for your help, Birgit. We, we hope you have a very good uh, Service Design Day in, uh, in Germany. Thank you so much for being with us. We can hang out a couple of minutes for maybe one more question from the panel. Maybe Jess can answer a question for us. Birgit, thank you so much. Have a lovely evening in Europe, and we hope to talk um, to you very soon. Thank you for having me. I hope uh, it gave some food for thought. I enjoyed it. It was very vivid. Bye-bye. Bye. Um, do we have one more question from uh, the audience that uh, maybe Krista or Jess or Mauricio can uh, field? Brendan? Yeah, no, we, we have a, a couple here. Um, uh, this is going to be for the panel, right? So I know you guys intended these for to be to, to be for Birgit, but uh, um, Ruben asked, Ruben Sonny said he'd love to hear a little bit uh, more about examples where service design relates with organizational transformation and helping clients realize opportunities that we find as service designers. Anybody have any examples, you know, kind of on the opening up to the co hosts and co-hosts? Uh, examples where service design relates with org transformation. We talked think, a little bit about I think just just can probably handle that one, right? Yeah, yeah, it's 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 very very common. And and in fact, I would say it's more common than not to have service design relate to some kind of organization transformation because when we're thinking about service design, what we're trying to do is not just design an experience that's great for a customer or a user on the front end, but we're also trying to make sure that the organization is set up to be able to deliver it. So you can't often do that without making a transformation within the organization or making some changes within the organization to allow you to deliver that new service or that new experience. And so it's so it's very common whenever you're doing any kind of design work for a new service or, or even a new product, um, that you that we as service designers would want to get into changing how the teams are structured or how some of the processes are designed, how the data models work or how the different systems work or the different technology that might be feeding the service or experience that we want to deliver. And so that happens all the time, you know, in the work that we've done for Barclays or Standard Life or in the US, you know, we're doing some work for a fashion tech startup at the moment. Um, for, you know, Chris has done some work for kind of Vanguard and some of the other um, uh, financial services organizations out on the East Coast. So whenever we do this kind of work, um, it always has an org transformation component and org change component. I don't know if anyone else would want to add some examples. I just added in the chat, that was my exposure to SD at Capital One. Yeah. It, it yeah. actually required us to restructure our lines of business and how our product teams and tech teams align to moments in, a, in the consumer's journey, even as opposed to just business capabilities um, and having, you know, parallel and lateral yeah. and all that stuff. So yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. Well, one thing that is, um, um, I've been through very uh, often is uh, it's uh, surprisingly enough when you present you start a project and you kind of map the what's happening from a customer uh, perspective and you present to uh, the organization. Many times I've heard the director, the manager responsible for that journey uh, literally freaking out and say, this is what happens. This is what's <laughs> happening. 
And the team kind of looked, yeah, yeah, it's been like this for years. That stops now. And, and many times, just by showing this uh, broader perspective, which is not rocket science, of course, you have to navigate, know how to navigate the, the organization. You provide the, a lot of value, right? So a couple of times I, I've heard the manager, the CEO that was hiring the project saying, okay, it's done. The project is done. I, you, you, I know what to do now, right? So it's very, um, let's say, rewarding to see that things that for us are so simple, mm. just going around, putting all together and show back to the organization has such a tremendous impact. Uh, so it's not even rocket science in a way, right? It's just show yeah. people what's happening. I mean, quite a lot of the time, people don't even know how things work in their organization themselves. So there's, so this is the first time that they've seen how many teams are involved or how many systems are involved or how many bits of data are flowing off into a spreadsheet of systems that's a risk for them. Like this is quite often the first time they'll ever see that for themselves. So it's yeah. a, yeah, it can be a huge trigger for, for things to change. Last, last week I saw um, uh, an internal... Uh, journey from a bank, uh, large bank in the U.S., connecting all the key performance indicator by department. Mm -hmm. It blew their mind internally, right? So someone just mapped the journey and then grabbed all the key performance indicators off each one of the silos and put them in a single picture, connecting everything. Blown away, the, the impact of the organization, inside the organization was awesome. Like everybody could place themselves and connect actual, uh, not even smarter or more refined KPIs, just the KPIs that they have individually into a whole picture change the dynamic in, in terms of organizational transformation, right? So yeah. we, need to, we need to wrap things up. Um, many, many, many thanks to everybody involved in this survey. I really, really want people to go and take it because we're going to be having probably in a couple of months the uh, sharing the final results. So we're not really quite sure what the final is going to be, but we have the preliminary results right now. So thank you so much for uh, Jess, Krista, Mirthe, uh, Bethany for uh, spearheading this, uh, this effort on the frog side. Thank you, Mauricio, for participating on the education side of it. Uh, we hope to get some great results to share to everybody and most likely to have a benchmark to actually just pursue this effort every year to kind of like figure where we're going on service design in the US and eventually North America. So thank you so much to all of you uh, for all the hard work. Um, if you have taken the survey, thank you so much. If you have not taken the survey, please take it. If you know people who should be taking the survey, please forward it to them. Um, and um, we will probably see you next time. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Well done. It's fun hosting. Thank you. Bye. Happy service design day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Happy service design day. Yeah. <laughs>